Welcome everyone as we continue here at St. Matthew's Church in Glendale, California in our study of 1 Corinthians. We just barely broke ground on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 last week and so you can turn in your Bibles now as I'm talking to 1 Corinthians 12. As Paul has been talking these last few chapters, he's trying to give practical advice for how do we live as the church in this in this culture with two different uh, backgrounds in the sense of Jewish and Gentile, and they're also in this pagan city, and how does the, this new Christian community kind of integrate and be faithful to their faith in Christ while dealing with all those things around them. And here in chapter 12, he's starting to talk about spiritual gifts, and he just launched into that last week. We're a few verses in, but I'm going to start again. I'm going to read from chapter 12, verse 1 to get us back in, in the right space. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and strayed away to mute idols. Therefore I tell you, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. We talked last week that that's somewhat of a hyperbole. He's talking about saying it with meaning. But from here, he's going to make his shift into talking about spiritual gifts. And spiritual gifts, we heard are the different words that are used here in the Greek are the manifestations. These are manifestations of the Spirit. And in verse 4, we're going to hear the word of charism or charismaton, which is where we get the word charism or charisma. Oh, it's where we get the word charismatic. All of these things come from this base. And why don't we start there, verse 4, Carolyn, please. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. So there is a variety, or do you have other translations than variety? Different. Different. Differences. Differences. Diversities. Diversities. That's, I think, uh, I mean, these all work <laughs> translated, but in my mind, that picture is a good way to picture it. There's a diversity. Think of a diversity. We talk about unity and diversity. That's really Paul's message here in verse 4. There's a diversity of these gifts, these charisms, these gifts of the Spirit. Charism is the word. But it's all the same spirit. Verse 5, Dalton, please. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. So there are also a variety or different kinds or a diversities of ways in which you can serve. And the word there, serve, is the root for diaconine, which is where we get diaconus or deacon. Uh, if you were in worship at St. Matthew's today, Deacon Nancy Ackerman read, this is the root of that word. The, in, in the church, we talk of ministers of word and service, which are pastors, or word and sacrament, which are pastors, and ministers of word and service, which are the deacons. But all people are also ordained to that ministry of word and service in our baptism. We all have different ways that we serve. But even though there are different ways that we serve, it's all under the same Lord. There is diversity in unity in Christ. Verse 6, Pam, please. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Workings there is energamaton. Enegar. What does that sound like? Energy. energy. So this is the root word for energy, right? There's different kinds of energy. The Spirit is working through all these gifts in the church. There are different kinds of energy which energizes us in different ways. The word there, that base word which we translate, which we get energy from, can be translated as different ways of operating, different ways of performing, different ways of energizing. Think of when you hear energizing, does that bring a visual image to mind? 
energy buddy. The energizer buddy. I knew that. I mean, that shows us the power of advertising, right? An advertising image that's been there so long, but that does work here. Think of there's different ways that the spirit keeps this thing going all the time. The spirit is constantly at work in the church through all of these different gifts, and yet it is the same God who is in all people carrying this out. It is the same spirit giving these gifts, and the spirit is working in all of these diverse ways with diverse gifts in diverse service but it's all god who through this is energizing the church the church is energized the church is operating the church performs its work through these gifts of the spirit it's not something we choose it's not something we earn it is a free gift of the spirit all of these different gifts given to the church for the church's work. So, Pastor, I've, I've got, if you look at those first two verses, I think five and six, mm -hmm. at least in my version, the phrasing is all, almost underlined each other. Same spirit, same Lord, same God. So you've, you've got the Trinity all right there. Oh, yeah. Very, very true. They are all there. Yeah, I didn't mm -hmm. even look at it, but you're right. Uh, we would say that would be an early uh, Trinitarian reference. Absolutely. Gene, uh, verse 7, please. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So manifestation, the word here we talked about last time, the phoneros, this manifestation or manifesting. Do you have other translations than manifestation? Mm -mm. Everyone Staying has manifestation. Work. Okay. What was that, Dalton? Same at work. Same at work. Same at work? Same. Same as in Saul. Same at work. Seen at work. Oh, okay. Seen at work. Okay, that's a way of spelling that out. To each one, the work of the Spirit is seen, and it's seen for the common good. Or what other translations than common good? Useful purpose. Useful purpose. Good purpose. Good purpose. I have spirit is given, so there's no manifestation, yeah. but the way it's given. Right. To each one the spirit is given? There's no verb for manifestation? No, the particular way in which the spirit is given. Oh, particular way is how they're translating the phoneros there. Yeah. Okay. And the old King James says, is given to every man to profit with all. Profit mm -hmm. works, absolutely. It's for the profit of the entire church. Uh, this could also be translated, and it's, this sounds a little more pious. Maybe it works a little better here. For the edification of the church. We talk about the building up of the church, the edifying of the church. That's very much here. To each one, to each member of the church, some manifestation of the Spirit, some power, some, some way of making manifest of the Spirit is given not just for the individual, but for the common good, for the good of all, for the benefit of all. Verse 8, Judy D, please. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Now this is a verse which gets maybe misunderstood in some circles, but let's look at it more closely. To one person in the church, the Spirit gives the gift of the message of wisdom. It's Logos Sophias. Logos Sophias. The word, basically, of wisdom. Sophias. Wisdom. It is intelligence in a sense, but wisdom is more than intelligence, isn't it? How would you describe wisdom? Prompt or very good use of the intelligence. That's a good way. That's good. Uh, it couples common sense with the knowledge, we might say. Good at practical application of the knowledge, when to use it. So some people in the church have a gift of they are, they're knowledgeable, they're insightful, but they also kind of have that tempered understanding of, of how and when to use the different knowledge. To another is given the message of knowledge itself. It's Logos Gnosius there, which is more the gift of insight, we might say. So some people kind of know the facts. They have, they have a good knowledge base, and they know 
you know, wise way how to apply it. Some others kind of have almost an illuminating sense of they get a special insight when they read scripture. Maybe they maybe they pick things up in the scripture or in conversation with others that others just don't see. They can really penetrate and be insightful of the situation. Uh, how about Terry verse nine? To another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit. Now faith, some have faith. All Christians are given faith, right? I mean, that's kind of the main, we talked about Luther's explanation to the third article of the creed last week. I cannot by my own reason or strength come to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or believe in him, but the Holy Spirit has called me. We're all called to faith. But what it's saying here, Paul is telling us, that some people kind of have a special measure of faith. You might have a spiritual gift of faith. Faith is always a spiritual gift, but there seems to be some special spiritual gift. There was someone who used to be in the congregation that I know uh, others kind of looked at as having, uh, in a sense, like a childlike faith in a sense, but just an unshakable faith people would talk about, that no matter what happened, they just always clung to their faith. That's more, we all have faith, but some people seem to have that special spiritual gift that just in, in the face of anything, the faith is strong. Some have the gift of healing. Now, that might be at times something which seems miraculous, but it also can be that the Spirit giving out that ability to be a healing presence, be the healer in the room. Uh, somebody mentioned, oh, maybe it was Melissa. Did you mention Nowen earlier? Was that you? Somebody mentioned Henry Now. Yeah, Henry Nowen. Uh, Henry Nowen, famous theologian. Uh, his most famous book was called The Wounded Healer. And talking about how uh, in the church uh, leaders are all wounded, but we all then become healers out of that. There can be that special sense of being able to heal. This isn't necessarily Benny Hinn with his hand and his white jacket and all of that. This is a sense of healing presence and the sense of ability to heal. And at times, maybe, like we heard in today's, uh, in today's sermon text here at St. Matthew's, maybe some special miraculous situations. Verse 10, uh, Judy <clears throat> To another, the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So now he's getting into kind of a long list and, and understand as he lists these things off, he's not attempting to give us an exhaustive list. That would be an overly fundamentalistic way of reading the text. Some people might want to try to read this and, well, this is all the spiritual gifts. We take all that Paul said in different places and we can come up with a comprehensive list. That's never Paul's intent. Paul's giving us examples. And remember, he's writing specifically to the church at Corinth. So he's probably specifically thinking of people there in Corinth that he has met and thinking of gifts that they might have. And so he's reflecting on these gifts that are probably present there, and he knows it. To some, there are miraculous powers. What other translations do you have for that? The working of miracles. Yeah. Working of miracles. Yeah. The words, basically, it's... it's power of miracles. Power of miracles. And power. They got power in there. That's good. Basically, it's the power of energy would be the most literal translation. The two words here are power and energy. So I would say most translators go to miraculous there. But if you actually look at those two root words, the power of energy, that isn't necessarily something which is mysteriously miraculous. But power of energy, think of... Can you picture somebody having the spiritual gift in the church of just the power of energy in the church? How might you perceive that or how much you, how might you picture that? We might say a, dy a dynamic presence. That that would be a that would certainly be a uh, 
a reasonable translation of what's here, a dynamic presence. Can you think of people who have been leaders in the church who have a dynamic presence that when they come into the room, people are listening, people are attentive because they just have that, that presence in the room. That really could be what's meant here. To another prophecy, prophecy we tend to think of prediction, but it doesn't actually mean that. To have the gift of prophecy simply means to be able to speak forth God's word. Literally, the word means speak forth. Some are given the gift of being able to speak forth God's word. So sometimes we talk about somebody being a prophetic preacher. doesn't mean that they're predicting the future. It means that they have a voice, which is that powerful voice to speak forth God's word. Some can distinguish between spirits or other translations. Uh, the gift of recognizing spirits. Gift of recognizing spirits, okay. Learning of spirits. Discernment. Yeah. Discernment, okay. They're discerning. Again, this can maybe be overly spiritualized, and we don't know all that Paul was observing there, but if we look at the base root of what the Greek says, it's it's pneumaton, so it's the spirit of what's happening, discerning of spirits, trying to see between the spirits. This is somebody who kind of has that maybe keen sense of, well, this seems to be from God, but this really doesn't seem to be from God. We shouldn't be going down this path because it might sound okay, but this path is going to lead to a bad place. This path may lead to destruction. Some people are kind of given that insight and think of, try to picture in your mind somebody with that insight of being able to see this isn't wise, this seems to be from God, but this really isn't. Some then next have the ability for different kinds of tongues, speaking in different kinds of tongues, or do you have other translations there? Various kinds. Various kinds. Various kinds, diverse kinds. This is seems to be a specific translation, uh, a translatable language that some people can speak in a specific language that they did not know before this. Uh, when you think of the book of Acts, what story does it bring to mind? Pentecost. 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 Yeah. It seems Pentecost. to be that miracle of Pentecost where somehow these simple disciples are able to speak and people from all over the Greco-Roman world at that point can hear and understand them in their same language. That seems to be largely what Paul is dealing with here, but we can't say exactly what he's talking about. But it's coupled there with the next phrase, which is the interpretation of tongues. Or do you have other translations for that? No. no. The ability to interpret them. Ability to interpret tongues. The word is glossalia is the root word here for the tongues, oh. which is speaking in different kind of tongues. But here the interpretation is hermeneia. Hermeneia, from which we get our word hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is trying to understand and interpret the Bible in a sense. Uh, our hermeneutical approach to understanding scripture, we might say. All of that is based on a Greco-Roman god. Can you think of who that might be? Hermes. 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 Right, Dalton. He was supposedly the god of what? The messenger. He's a messenger because he was God of speech, right? So that's where this root word comes from, that some are almost like the imaginary Hermes who can bring this message forth from something which is not earlier understood. That's kind of their speech that not all understand, but some are given the ability to interpret this for everyone. Verse 11, where do we, how about Dennis? All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. Whatever the gift is that a particular person has, where the, are, and he's going to go into a little bit more of this in a little while, but here he's kind of given this non-comprehensive list, but he's listed some things, probably some things that he sees there in Corinth. 
these are all coming these are all from one spirit they're all the energy energy again here they're all the energy of one spirit and the spirit decides when and where to give them because the spirit is working for the good of the saints the spirit is working for the good of the church and the spirit obviously has a divine perspective that none of us can and so the spirit pours out different gifts in different places for the church to go forward in proclaiming the gospel from that he's going to shift here to another image which he uses in different places which will sound more familiar diane if you read 12 please the body is a unit though it is made up of many parts and all its parts are many they form one body so it is with christ so remember, as I gave our introduction okay. to chapter 12 last week, I kind of, for those of you who were with us last week, I kind of got, gave that illusion that he's going to start talking about the body. And this is Greco-Roman society, where it's very much a patriarchal, hierarchical culture. And Paul tends to talk about different parts of the body all having a purpose. And he's going to go into that somewhat here. The body is made up of many parts, and though there are many parts, it's still one body. It isn't about I'm better than, you're, than you are because I am this and you are that. It's not I've got more power in the church because I've got this position and not that, or I have this gift and not that. We're all one because, verse 13, Mike, please. In, uh, yes, sorry. In the one spirit, we were all baptized, Jews as well as Greeks, slaves as well as citizens, and one spirit was given to all to drink. Put this into the greater context. Big okay, circle. One spirit was given to us all to drink. Us all to drink. Put this into the bigger picture. Circles of context here. Bigger picture of the overall context of Corinthians. This uh, First Corinthians, his main purpose in writing First Corinthians is to take this church that's got all kinds of problems and people are fighting and try to bring them back together and unify them and deal with some of the problems. This verse is key to that. The reason the Spirit gives out these different gifts is for the body to grow, the word to be proclaimed. Everyone, no matter what gift you have, no matter what position in the church you have, it doesn't matter. It's not a hierarchy. We're all part of the same body. And that's because we were all baptized by the same spirit. It doesn't matter if here you are what? The slave or slave. You are Christian. We're great. It doesn't slave matter if free. you're Jew. Slaves are free. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, slave or free. And remember, this comes right after what we studied about, what he was talking about, about communion in the last chapter and how that was really, uh, it, what his warnings about that were very much about economics and the wealthy not uh, abusing the, the poor in the church. This is, we see a break here because we put these chapter numbers in, but Paul, as this flows, this is part of that same idea doesn't matter what your position is, doesn't matter what your wealth is, doesn't matter if you're slave or free, we are all in the one baptism. We've been baptized the same, and in baptism we are all one. There is no longer any differences in the church. We're all one, and we're all given the spirit to drink. The spirit hey, Pastor comes Keith? Yes. Pastor Keith, in the song, One Bread, One Body, woman or man is added to that list. Well, and that comes from uh, Galatians chapter 3. There's neither male nor female. He adds yeah. there. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, so what he seems to be saying is don't confuse uniformity with unity. There's okay. different parts, but we're all united. Absolutely. That's, that's that uh, the unity in diversity, diversity in unity. Yep. It's not about uniformity, and it's not about a hierarchy. And I think we will stop there for today, but we have one or two moments for a question. He's going to continue with this deeper thought of the body being many parts and talk about the different parts next week. Okay. Yeah. Comments? Question? Yes. Could you talk a little bit about discernment, please? Discernment is, is having that judgment. I mean, it's almost like wisdom in a sense. Uh, 
it's it's having a sound good judgment in things to see between where is this coming from where does this lead to what's the source of this what's the outcome of this that's discernment in a sense so it's beyond doctrinal understanding oh absolutely i mean that would be more the knowledge base uh discernment would be more application closer to wisdom more mm -hmm. using the wisdom and understanding mm -hmm. Uh, is that prompted from something? That question? It's just always struck me that discernment would be a heck of a curse of a gift to have to live with because you take a lot of flack in the church for that, maybe. <laughs> I, I think that's true, but I also... Uh, well, I take that into the uh, schoolroom, those of us who have taught. Um, you do a lot of discernment uh, yeah. in the course of a day. Uh, who shows up that day? Who is that person? Is it that child may have a difficulty, a look on their face, a, a something that troubles them? You, you, your job is to discern how well these children are, how receptive they are to learning. Is there an issue and, and so forth? In other words, there's lots of little quick judgments, quick little discernments that happen as you teach. It's true. Yeah. It would seem like, you know, we have the other phrase about interpreting as well, and it's a matter of whether, whether you're um, making, a, a, making a declaration or an interpretation, or whether you're deciding, you know, discerning, is now the time to make that decision. It, it's, it's like the old phrase, your mother always told you there's a time and place for everything. Well, that's discernment, you know, it's just the right time that I want to say, you were really wrong on that, and, and then find out what's behind it yeah you know like in the classroom or in a in a church setting or anywhere else really that's very very accurate I think. and and then and then that's tied into wisdom having that discernment and wisdom of i mean in some sense you might use the phrase pick your battles at times not that it's always about a battle but it's it's having that sense of there are times when you may be right but this isn't the time to be right about it right right yeah correct as opposed to right. <laughs> All right. Why don't we close oh with prayer? In Jesus, God has come to live in our world. Let us pray for all our needs. We pray for the family of God, that we will give without counting the cost. Let us pray to God. God, God receive our prayer. prayer. We pray for all those in need that by our actions, great or small, we can proclaim Jesus' presence amongst us. Let us pray to God. God, God receive our prayer. our prayer. We pray for those who serve others in difficult circumstances, that God may help them carry their cross. Let us pray to God. God, God receive, receive our, prayer. our prayer. We pray for St. Matthew's Church and all worshiping oh, communities, yeah that we might welcome the stranger without hesitation. Let us pray to God. God, God receive our prayer. Receive our prayer. God, ever present, listen to our prayers. Bring us to your kingdom where Jesus is Lord forever and ever. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.